My name is Hamish McDonald. I'm the senior foreign correspondent for Network 10, uh, the new George, George Negus program, which has just begun. Um, obviously, there's been some dramatic events in the last few weeks. They're continuing. Uh, I've just returned from Egypt and probably should be in Libya right now. Uh, the colleagues sitting here on the stage with me know a lot about uh, this topic and uh, are here tonight to uh, endow us with some of their knowledge and, and insights into all of it. Uh, I'll begin by introducing them to you all. Uh, just to my left, to, to the right, looking at it from the audience, is Professor Fedi Mansouri, who's a leading researcher at Deakin University and a prominent scholar nationally and internationally. He was born in Tunis and was actually in Tunisia and Egypt uh, when these uprisings first began. So welcome. Thank you. Next to Professor Mansouri is Dr. Sally Totman. She's a senior lecturer at Deakin University and a commentator on Middle East politics, terrorism, and international relations. She's authored several books and papers of note in the Green Zone, 40 Years with Colonel Gaddafi, 2009, as well as that, The Rise of and Decline of Libya as a Rogue State, 2008. I don't know whether that needs a, a postscript. Uh, and The Journalist and Islam, Competing Agendas, Political Correctness, and the War on Terror, 2007. So, Dr. Topman, thank you. And also with us here on the stage is Dr. Larry Stillman. He has a PhD from Monash University in the Sociology of Technology and works on these issues. He also has degrees from the University of Melbourne, Hebrew University of Jerusalem and Harvard, specialising in, until he gave up, as an Assyriologist, a specialist in ancient Mesopotamia. He also studied Arabic and, of course, Hebrew. So thank you very much. I want to first start with uh, Professor Mansouri because you were in uh, Tunisia and Egypt a fairly short time ago as all of this was, was beginning. I know Tunisia was starting to kick off when you were there, but when you were in Egypt, did you have any inkling as to what was to come? No, I don't think so, actually. I think when I was in Egypt uh, in December, uh, the mood has always been, for the last couple of years, I think there has been a, a momentum uh, building up in Egypt, and I think the key issue there was that people were definitely not very happy about plans for uh, succession, a plan that Mubarak was developing and really preparing his son Gamal for, to take over in Egypt. I think that in itself was, was, was a big rallying cry for the Egyptian. There has been a movement that has developed over the last few years, which is known as Kifaya, that is enough is enough. That movement that resisted the succession within the family of Mubarak combined with the situation that the Egyptian economy finds itself in, uh, extremely uh, in poor condition, if you like, overall. The, the nepotism that has uh, hit Egypt for, for the last 10 to 15 years, I think, uh, the political corruption, uh, the uh, poor status of the infrastructure in Egypt. Uh, anyone who goes to Egypt right now and ventures out of the Maidan Tahrir or, or, or the uh, uh, Tahrir Square and walks perhaps about two kilometers out of that diameter will be absolutely shocked to see the poverty and, and the decay in the Egyptian infrastructure. I think if you combine all of that uh, with the fact that, uh, politically speaking, Egypt was heading towards uh, what I would call just an explosion sooner or later, I think I'm not, I'm not surprised. I've been to Egypt many times, and every time I go back, I'm still shocked to find little progress was being made. Uh, you add to it other factors, lack of uh, uh, space for political uh, organizing, if you like. Civil society was very much suffocated. Uh, political parties really uh, put under a lot of duress. Um, the only real opposition that was able to test the Egyptian regime was very much the Islamic Brotherhood, but even that wasn't legalized. So the, the situation in Egypt really was, uh, I think in my view, was bound to explode sooner or later. And when it happened, uh, 11 days after the Tunisia events, I wasn't, I wasn't uh, surprised to, to the least. A lot of people were surprised at the timing, though. A lot of people said, you know, that they were there within recent months, and there, yes. there was just no sign that this was about to kick off. Even the protesters, the ones that, that planned that initial, initial January protest, said, we thought maybe 50,000 people. We were shocked when this turned into a revolution. A very pleasant surprise, I must say. <laughs> a very pleasant surprise. I, I was one of the people who uh, were in Tunisia 10 days into the revolution. I, I must say I was uh, not expecting that two weeks later, I'm back in, in Melbourne, and two weeks later, Ben Ali would, would actually flee Tunisia. 
Uh, that, that is a surprise, not just to myself, by the way, even to the people who were involved in these, in these uprisings. The reason being, and this is a bit of history, if you like, the reason being, that's never been the case in the Arab world that a civil revolution took place. We had a lot of military revolutions of the early 50s in Egypt. We had the military revolution in Libya in the six, late 60s. We had a number of military uh, uh, developments, if you like. We never had a civil society-driven revolution that is very much divorced from opposition parties. All right. I think that's a good point to pause you there, because I think we'll come back to that issue. That's, I, I think, a significant part of our discussion. Sally Topman, you, I note with interest, wrote the rise and decline of Libya as a rogue state. It surely has gone back to rogue state status uh, this week, at least. Did you have any degree of surprise about the way this has spread and, and we've seen this situation evolve into to one that's now almost entirely focused on Libya? Um, I'm actually very surprised that it spread to Libya, mostly because Gaddafi has managed to remove all opposition, secular, Islamist, any opposition uh, in the last 42 years. He's had plenty of time to get rid of anyone who opposed him. And he has a sort of, I suppose, a habit of um, hunting down dissidents and killing them. Um, and that discourages people from rising up against him. So I am surprised it spread to Libya. And what about the, the fact that uh, the, the sort of intricate nature of Libyan tribal culture uh, has perhaps kept him in that place for a long time. Do you think that that makes him harder to remove or easier to remove? As he pointed out, he doesn't have an, opici a, a, an official position. Uh, it's just his gun that's keeping him there. Um, I think he certainly fostered those tribal divisions, which has helped solidify his Jamahiri and his rule. But I don't think that the tribal divisions will keep him there. I think at this point it might be a little too late for him um, to sort of keep that going. What do you think about the way the world views him? Because he was so long considered this, this rogue, if you like. In recent years, he's come back into the fold. He did the right thing, the West told us, uh, following you know, the, the beginning of the war on terror, as it was known. Uh, and then suddenly he's sort of turned into the devil I in the last week. I mean, is it just that the world sort of chooses to, to uh, view people in certain ways when it's convenient? I think so. Gaddafi hasn't changed. He's been the same man from the mid-70s until this week. Um, we've just chosen to view him in certain ways, I think, uh, because it suits our policies. And post-September 11, he was no longer needed as a rogue or a demon. Um, we had other ones. You know, we had Osama bin Laden, who was much more interesting and, and successful, I suppose. Um, but Gaddafi's been the same Gaddafi. All right. Dr. Larry Stillman, what is going on in your view more broadly? Is this, I, I noted yesterday an Iranian scholar said that you should fold up all your old political maps of the Arab world, put them away because we need to draw new ones. Do, do you believe that? Well, if you think in terms of social media, that is the use of mobile phones, tweet, Facebook and all those types of things, it reflects what's happening throughout the world. And if you think of the rise of the educated middle class in the Arab world, students and so on, they are as much in touch as anyone else. And throughout those parts of the world, in fact, not nearly everyone, but the spread of mobile phones is amazing. So even someone who's not exactly poor but has a job will have a mobile phone, will have some way of sending messages and receiving uh, messages. So what's going on, it's very easy to bypass old structures and parties and so on. And I can speak as, a, as an academic here. It's really something that's using what's called the, the strength of weak ties. It's not so much about who you know face to face, but you can find information or get information to a, a friend of a friend of a friend of a friend of a friend or back from a friend of a friend of a friend. Is and that's a very powerful with social thing. networking though. I mean Libya potentially doesn't have the same access or Libyans don't have the same access to Twitter, Facebook that Egyptians have had. I don't know about uh, Libya, but it certainly seems to have been the case in Egypt where you, apparently there's a couple of young intellectuals or middle-class academics who, who started off a Facebook site and so on. Yeah, and I guess just, you're talking about uh, Wal Ghanim, the, the young the Google executive. Yeah, and it just exploded. But of course, they aren't the only ones and they're building on something that, it, that has been there for a long, long time. And, and they're using the IT in exactly the same way as we do. Fadi mm. Mansouri, do, do you think that's where civil society has become empowered through social media? Yeah. It's, it's an extremely uh, important, I think, question to uh, perhaps explore here. Uh, 
There's a lot of debate now about the extent to which social media has driven this. Uh, and the role of social media, and, and I, I agree. I think uh, social media has been, uh, and social networking in general, has been influential and very useful, but only as a conduit. Mm. Only as a conduit. And I, and I stress that because these young people that have really led from the front these kind of political uh, processes and brought about two feared dictators in the Middle East, and now they're just about to bring down a third, and who knows where they will, they will stop. These people, they not only use social media, they constructed a political discourse. They constructed a political message. They were able to very, very uh, powerfully capture the mood of the nation. Uh, just to give you an example here, in Tunisia, where this whole thing started, in central Tunisia, in a very remote province, Sidi Bouzid, uh, it could have been just a Sidi Bouzid incident. Uh, a, a desperate young man, uh, undertakes an act of self-emulation, sets himself on fire, simply because he felt basically rejected, alienated, harassed, and uh, his dignity was taken away from him. Now, that could have stopped there with some re re remedies from local governments. And, but what happened is the young people who knew about that started to really capture the mood of the nation, that this is symptomatic of something much, much deeper. And what is much deeper about Tunisia which, by the way, is far more uh, doing far better than Egypt, Libya, etc., on a lot of economic and social indices. But what it, what it is symptomatic of is that time has come to reject a political system, to reject a political culture where dignity is not protected, it's not guaranteed, where there is no equal distribution of resources, where political corruption is endemic, where nepotism is everywhere, and therefore this is a historical moment for us, young people, highly, highly educated, and have access to social uh, uh, media, to use this tool, because we've been suffocated. There is no political oxygen. Civil society is about having space. Space was taken away from them. So what they do, they create the virtual space on Facebook, Twitter, Internet. And really that reconstructing of civil society as no longer needing to be physical, but it can be virtual, is what allowed these young people to propagate a very powerful message. Well, uh, that I was, want to was... interject here, because how did this happen in Libya, where they haven't had the same space as we've heard it described? Um, I, w I will say that mobile phones aren't as you know, popular in Libya or available as they are in, in the rest of the Middle East, um, and Gaddafi does shut down the communications network. But the thing that's important about social media in terms of Libya is that we've actually seen an alternate viewpoint. Not a lot of it, but we have seen postings on YouTube that we wouldn't have otherwise seen because the state media controls everything. There is no CNN or BBC in Libya. And so, what about Al Jazeera? Can you get the Arabic broadcasters or Al Arabic? No, Are they broadcast there? Uh, no, they're banned. Um, they're seen as, uh, well, I guess, rats and cockroaches. Um, so I think that was a quote. That was, that was, a, <laughs> that was a quote. It was a joke. Um, but essentially what we've seen is CNN being able to um, speak to Libyans inside using their mobile phones and for them to be able to post on the internet you know, videos of what's going on, which we've never seen before. And Gaddafi's had lots of protests against him during the 42 years and he's always had the same response of coming out really hard and cracking down on people and the protests don't normally last more than two or three days but I think because they've had access to the outside world to get their message across it's actually allowed the protest to continue. Mm -hmm. Dr Stillman do you think the social media revolution is too much to uh, to describe these these uh, movements? It's part of a longer story, and we don't know the full story yet. So in Egypt, what, it's a month or so of this now. But in six months' time, a year's time, who is going to run the show? You can't run a nation through the social media. And my concern is that many people will get bored fast because it's not exciting anymore. And then, so who is going to be the new leadership? In fact, are we going to get are the, some of the old guys going underground for a while and then coming back well, do, do you think and setting I mean, up the same structures again? I mean, one of the strengths of social media is that it puts power back into the hands of the people. Do you think in a way that it's putting too much hands into the hands of the people? I mean, we're, we're hearing quite serious talk about while Ghanim 
potentially running for, for president. He's 30 years old. He was a marketing executive for Google. He's got no political experience, and yet he's the guy that's leading the negotiations with the military generals that are now running the place. Mm. That's, the, I don't know the right answer. All he can do is stand for election and see what happens in but a democracy, you know, which is exactly what You look like you want to say something very much. I want to say something because it did actually happen that uh, there's a young blogger, a young blogger in Tunisia who uh, was actually detained and jailed in the last days of the Ben Ali regime. And um, the reason why he was jailed because he was very critical of the way he handled the initial reaction to the uh, uh, to the um, uh, self emulation of uh, Bouazizi, this young guy. Now that guy, as soon as the revolution uh, took place, uh, he's only 26 year old guy, uh, was not only released from jail, but uh, he was made the junior minister in the new cabinet of the, in the national government of uh, national unity. So if, if you don't want to do blogging, any, you know, this is really a very uh, a fruitful and uh, uh, beneficial way of getting a very high powered job is to become a very powerful voice in this new social media that you're describing. And I don't think the person was interested in politics, it's a young guy, he's a very, very articulate young guy. He wasn't interested in politics, but he felt it's a burden upon him now to be the, perhaps the, the intermediate between young people who he thinks he represents and between the new government of national unity which has just emerged. And, and I think you're gonna see more of that, by the way. Uh, these people said, we the young people brought about this change, we want to have a powerful voice yeah. in whatever decision you guys make. And uh, there's lots of nice colorful language here. For instance, we don't want uh, bald and, and, and white-haired men leading us anymore. Yeah. We want people with some black hair. With a few badges. I felt like, oh, I felt <laughs> like, go really good. I said, yeah. you know, I ticked the box there. It, just, it might be quite interesting. Who, who in the audience, if you can put up your hand, thinks it's a good thing that we're seeing this people power on the streets of, uh, of the Arab world? Anyone? So, I mean, it's a pretty overwhelming majority. It's difficult not to get swept up by the images of what we're seeing. But I have to say, standing on, on the streets of Cairo when the, you know, the, the guys came in on the horses and the camels and started clubbing people and, and attacking us, it didn't feel like such a great thing. It felt like a really volatile, unstable situation. Um, Dr. Topman, do you think that what is being unleashed is perhaps more than what the people who have unleashed it can manage? Um. Certainly. I think the, there's two main issues of what's sort of come about is that overthrowing these sort of dinosaur governments has meant that there are no, there's no one with any experience in government at all. Um, you know, particularly in Libya and in Egypt where it was all cronies of, of the leaders. There's no one who's got any experience in running a country. I think the second uh, issue is that for whoever takes over, there are no quick fixes to the problems. They can't fix unemployment overnight or even in the short to long term future maybe. Uh, they can't provide enough food, they can't provide enough housing, they can't provide um, the infrastructure that the people are demanding. And so whoever comes to power is set up to fail immediately. Um, if not sooner. Yeah, so you think this optimism that we see here today and uh, I'm sure shared around the world might be replaced by a very quick realisation of how difficult the job is? Um, look, I think it's great to be optimistic. I'm optimistic. I think, you know, it was a, a region long overdue for change. I just don't think that the change that we're seeing is um, going to bring solutions. I think the problems of the Middle East are going to be very deep and very entrenched for the next 50 years. Uh, uh, I, I think I understand where Sally is coming from, and I, I, to some degree I, I agree with the immediate diagnosis, but I also want to put a reality check here that, uh, to again, to quote some figures, the, situ the economic situation in Egypt and in Tunisia, and in Libya for that matter, if you look at the economy, and a lot of economists now are doing a lot of analysis and they're publishing reports, you will find that almost 40% of the economy in Tunisia, probably 60% of the economy in Libya, and we don't have percentages for Egypt yet, but probably similar figures, have been totally corrupted mm -hmm. and run by private, mil private ruling families, circles, mafias, militia, whatever you want to call them, which means the economy was actually functioning at only 40% 40, 40 full capacity. Now, you can imagine a country like Tunisia, for instance, and the, 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 the president's wife and her, her entourage basically hijacked 40% of the economy for their own, for their own benefits. And, you, and, and that economy was still delivering some level of service and some decent infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera. In my view, freeing up that other 40%, putting it back into the market out there, can only do good to that country. Uh, it will not fix all the problems. 
It will not create jobs to all the graduates. It will not uh, all of a sudden get rid of all the other uh, macro uh, things at the macro level of the economy. They, they still need to do a lot of it has that. Made it. I mean, there, there is an yeah. argument, though, that it has made it easy for Westerners to invest in these That's countries my, because they always point. know who the guy or the lady is to go to. That is my second point. There's another extremely important point here to make, not just Western investment, even local investment, domestic investment. A lot of people are no longer investing in those countries. Why? Because they're worried about the lack of political stability and they're worried about corruption. Mm. So there's a lot of money that's actually frozen out of the country, which could be injected immediately in big major projects that did not see the light of the day. Why? So you, you, you don't think there'll just be there. another Mr. Big or Mrs. Big that moves in and becomes the point person for business in Tunisia? No. I am absolutely certain that will not happen. And the reason that will happen is people now have realized the kind of corruption that was going on for 30, 40 years. I don't think anyone there will accept, uh, in the emerging new regime, will accept standards to be lowered back to the low that we saw in the last 30, 40 years. I am absolutely confident of that. And the reason why I'm confident is because now they can see, and now they're discovering, even now, every single day we discover on Facebook and news, and they're discovering the level of corruption that was going on there. It's unprecedented, mm. absolutely unprecedented. So people now are aware of that. They're demanding from the new political regimes that are going to be elected in six months' time that they need to measure up. If they do not measure up, we know that we can overthrow you. All right. Let's just talk about some geopolitics for, for, for a second, because I want to bring in the United States, the West, more broadly, and also Israel. We saw yesterday images of the first Iranian naval ships uh, sailing down the Suez Canal, the first time in 30 years. I mean, that's incredible, I think, that we're seeing that. Um, Larry Stillman, what does it mean? Well, they're obviously out to make a point in that uh, no, nobody's their master and they're always out t to annoy the Israelis and the Saudis and all the others as well and the Americans. But I think you really need to see it more broadly, in fact, that um, for Israel, and that's, I suppose, my specific interest, I see Israel at the moment as fairly snookered for at least f 40 years, so I'm speaking since the 67 war, they've been able to impose an, unf an occupation and manipulate and work with an unstable region so that their power and authority has never been challenged. Now, now they are facing a situation where they are dealing with an emergent uh, region of democracy that's not going to be controlled by the by the uh, the Americans or themselves, and Israel's options are becoming more and more limited. Israel has often argued for democracy in its neighbouring states. Isn't this a good thing? Well, as some of them said, well, you know, actually, <laughs> it's not that good. And my point is, I suppose. To be blunt, I, I personally feel that without Israel undergoing some fundamental structural changes in terms of the uh, relationship between um, Palestinians who live in Israel and Israeli Jews themselves, the state is doomed. It needs to become a secular open state in which everyone is truly equal. Now, a number of um, Palestinian Arabs have in fact been arguing a case like that, not that the state of Israel or a state where the Jews are free to live goes, but it needs to become an, an equal state and a democracy for all. Obviously uh, that is seen as a complete threat to uh, Zionism, but I really see no option that, that the kind of Zionism that has developed has gone its course and has failed. Isn't there a chance that the US will be wanting to reassure Israel more than ever that it's on its side right now as, as it appears that the, the, the dynamics of the region are changing and shifting so dramatically? If you had to choose between, what is it, 20, 30 Arab states in the region, oil and, and strategic interest, and Israel, I think you find that the Americans interest I will lie more and more in negotiating a new set of relationships with these states rather than just 
supporting Israel as an occupier and the rest of it, because Israel, I think, has argued a case that's been false for a long, long time, and the case no longer can, can stand, and there does need to be a fundamental change. At the same time, if Israel can uh, develop a, a, a real peace uh, with uh, neighbouring Arab states, meaning that they do recognise some form of homeland for Jews, but not a Zionist state, but one that is far more equal, I see that leading to a state of peace rather than this state of cold war or whatever you want to call it at the moment. Sally Topman, is, is that your view of things? Um, not at all. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I, I mean, I, I, don't, I think that having Israel as a proper democracy is probably um, a great idea. It's just not going to happen. Um, it was designed as a Jewish state. That's the purpose of Israel. If it became secular, it would no longer be a homeland for Jews. It would just be another state. Um, I think that the US is interested, yes, it's interested in oil, but it has a close relationship with Saudi Arabia, who has a quarter of the world's proven oil reserves, has a very close relationship with Iraq that has 10 percent of the world's proven oil reserves. I don't think it needs to worry about Iran and Libya. And the US doesn't actually uh, import oil from either of those countries. It goes to generally the EU. And so it doesn't affect the US. I think their relationship with Israel is uh, ideological more than anything else. And I think that that will continue. And I think that every day for the last 60 years, they've chosen Israel over the Arab states and they will continue to do so. An interesting, interesting that you raise that though, because I interviewed a couple of months ago, Christopher Pine, the, the liberal politician here in Australia, in, in Jerusalem, in East Jerusalem, in fact. Um, and he said to me that the reason why Australia, from his point of view, uh, stays on the side of Israel as it does is because we share values and the value being democracy. So what happens if the other states around there that clearly don't like Israel or at least the way Israel behaves also share that value which is democracy? How does that redefine the strategic relationship with Israel for countries like Australia and the United States? I, I don't think our relationship is about shared values of democracy. I think it's about shared values of other things. You know, Israel is... So you don't agree with him? I don't or agree you... with him. I think perhaps he's um, interpreting it in a way that suits himself. Right. Um, <laughs> and I do like him, so I'm being gentle. But the, um, in terms of Israel, it's a Western outpost in a very hostile region that uh, the West is generally scared of. You know, the clash of civilizations is something that we don't talk about much anymore, but it still exists. There but, but why does the West has, have to see this as a, as a difficult period? Shouldn't we all be sitting here enthusiastic? Shouldn't the politicians be enthusiastic like the, this audience is and, and welcome what's happening and say, this is, this is the new world? But shouldn't have we been then enthusiastic in 1979 when Iran became an Iranian republic that's a democracy? They have free and fair elections. Yeah. You know, we don't Didn't embrace their democracy. Way, <laughs> well, no, but it really is. I mean, that they were allowed to protest. They weren't being gunned down in the street. Ferdi Mansouri, do you think the West has played this well? I mean, that Obama has received some praise for, for being cautious, but at the same time uh, remaining on the side, ultimately, of the people. Well, I don't like Christopher Pine. Let's start there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, 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 you can just... squabble about Christopher oh, Pine after I want to just make that very clear. It's a very different... Just, just make that very clear. But no, I don't think the West has played this very well, actually. I think... Um, for all sorts of reasons. I, I can tell you why. One, one of the reasons why the West hasn't played this very well is because uh, they, they did wait and see. If you go back and look at the statements made initially, when people started to go to the streets, were very, very cautious. You know, we just call on you to be restrained, please. They didn't say we call on you to go and open up spaces, give these people freedom, you know, do some political reforms. It's all, it was all about minimizing violence and, and restraint. And so I don't... But wasn't it the responsible thing to do? I mean, if, they, if, the, if Obama had come out and said, go for it, folks, and then Mubarak had have cracked down, yeah. then he would have been held responsible for... At least a part. In exactly my point. That is exactly my point. I don't think the West in America has played this on the basis of some ethics, for instance, or on the basis of some clear principles in international relations. There's a lot of duplicity, uh, double standards. There, there's all sorts of kind of things that were going on. So we can't really argue that. And I'm not blaming them. Each country conducts its own foreign policy based on its own definition of national interest, and that's fair play to them. But that's not the real question we should be asking. The, Go on, what is it? <laughs> well, the real question should be asking, what will this mean 
to the American foreign policy in the region. How could this change the dynamics of those relationships? Uh, what, what does it mean now that a lot of these Arab countries are going to embrace democracies, are going to have representative governments, which may well not be, for instance, keen on a peace treaty between Israel and Egypt, which may well not be in favor of a blockade on Gaza, which may not be necessarily happy with what happened in Iraq. And you know that what's happening in Iraq right now. A lot of people are going to the streets and demanding that the current Maliki government is no longer legitimate mm. and it needs to be uh, removed. So this is, these are the key questions we need to be asking. Do you think, though, that the U.S. has been rightly cautious about welcoming people power in the Arab world? I don't believe that they're really generally welcoming people power. They have no option but to welcome it, I think, in my view. And the reason why they have no option but to welcome it is because they saw where it's going. It's going, and the end point of this people they, they, power... They've just backed the winner once they exactly, saw it. <laughs> exactly. They're backing the winner once again, and unfortunately they've done it a little bit late. And let me remind you, in the case of Libya that the reason why the Libya uh, uprising has been so bloody that the number of casualties has already exceeded 500 in less than six days. The reason why that happened in Libya is because since 2003, when Gaddafi was welcomed back in the international fold, the UK, the USA, and other European countries have been competing you know, in a rush to sell arms to Libya. Mm. They rearmed the Libyan, they rearmed the Libyan army. They armed him with all sorts of happy weaponry, I mean, which are being used right now against the civilians. It's interesting now, to see West, David Cameron is there, the British Prime Minister is there this week, at the one time saying we welcome civilian rule in these countries, but he's accompanied by, I think, eight of the bosses of the biggest weapons okay, manufacturers. And that's, what, yeah. and that's what makes me even more angry when these people come out and make their statements, because it's them who equipped Gaddafi with such a sophisticated set of weapons that he can use jet, uh, fire jets to, to, to fire on, on civilians in, in open squares. So do we think that anything that is happening now will change that relationship between the West and these countries? Let me, let me answer that question from a different angle. Uh, the, the Arab world, the Islamic world, the Middle East, if you like, has been continuously characterized as, as uh, one is not able of any political change anyway. Democracy is foreign to them. And if there is a change, it's by one of this trifecta of either foreign intervention, Iraq, Afghanistan, palace or military coup, happened many times, or assassinations. Or maybe in the case of Iran, radical uh, Islamism. Now, what's happening right now is showing that that's not necessarily the case. You can have civil revolutions led by indigenous young people who are not even in, in, into politics. So the West is really now into a new total, and your question, one of your earlier questions were, were actually spot on. The West needs to reconfigure it, the parameters of its foreign policy in the Middle East. Mm. How will it approach a new Middle East where legitimacy is now is actually with the people, where the street and the Arab masses are dictating and demanding that their new uh, decrees be implemented? Do you think... Do any of you think that there has been an assumption in, in many parts of the world that Arabs just can't do democracy? Do you think that that has existed? Yeah, of course. Why? Why? Colonialism. Do you, do you think it's racism? I guess I that's think what Israeli I'm governments have consistently taken that uh, viewpoint and always looked to working with elites. Um, because they see a, an influence of Islamism, of uh, tribalism, of, of local loyalties, of uh, clans, and so on. And, and I suppose, too, for, for, for Israelis, um, they've never really been uh, prepared to accept a challenge to their authority. So that's, in a sense, why they haven't been too strong on democracy for Arabs. But it's surely not just an Israeli thing that we have. Oh, I think no, there's a broader. feeling that um, democracy has to look like a Western democracy, which is secular, where there's a separation of church yeah. and state. And within the Middle East, it's impossible to separate, uh, separate out mosque and state because mm. Islam is so entwined with politics um, just because of the way the religion is. And so there's a feeling that it can't be a true democracy because, you know, religion gets in the way. Well, that true? Sorry, outside. I just want to ask about that because if you look at uh, Fatah, it, it always represented itself as a Palestinian secular nationalist movement. Yeah, he did. And, and religion took a second place. But he wasn't a democracy. Uh, no, but elsewhere in the Arab world, say in Lebanon, there's also been secular parties. So I question or 
query, in fact, the necessary link between Islam or religion and being an Arab, because you've always had, you know, orthodox uh, Greeks who were Arab nationalists, but not Muslim. So it's always been a bit more diverse than just Islam. Sure, but we are and talking Egypt about the Western cost. perception of, yeah. of the so region. Islam is 90% of the region. Can I, uh, I think it's, um, there's perhaps confusion here about democracy as a process and democracy as an outcome. I think the West would really like democracy as a process to be implemented in the Middle East. The problem is they don't like the outcome. Mm. <laughs> 1991 Algeria, yeah. democratic elections. The Islamists there were actually expected to have a landslide win. Guess what happens? Elections abandoned and the military was reinstated in power. And what followed in Algeria is civil war of um, like 500,000 people died. And the West was supporting the military. So if you ask the question, does the West like democracy? My answer to you is no, no, no. The West not, doesn't care about democracy in the Middle East. The West cares about the outcome of democratic processes. If it suits the objectives, they will be happy to go along. So that's why Hamas is not a... Well, I, mean, I, mean, I gave you another example of Algeria, not Hamas, because I think people always think of Hamas as being another thing. But even Algeria, which doesn't have anything to do with Israel, you know, it's far removed from that conflict. Uh, so, so for me, it's not about democracy as we see it in the West. It's about the West capacity to understand that democracy can take indigenous forms, that democracy can be married with Islamic values. But, but why is there, though, a difficulty with accepting the combination of Islam and politics in the Arab, wo Arab world, whereas, for example, in Malaysia or Indonesia, mm. there's not necessarily a problem with it? I mean, in well, Germany, you have Christian democratic parties. Yeah. But, 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 but Christian. there seems to be this particular fear of Islam being involved in politics. Yet in Indonesia, there's been, you know, obviously a long tradition of that, and, and, and successfully so post post Suharto in Malaysia. You know, it's been there for a long time. I think part of it was probably the. Um Iranian sort of anti-US rhetoric that came about after the revolution and that made everybody I guess in the US in particular fearful that all uh, Arab or Middle Eastern I should say not Arab but Middle Eastern uh, democracies would be anti-Western. We're starting to run out of time we're going to get to the questions but just let's throw things forward to the future uh, if we can because we keep hearing this sort of term domino effect. Are the dominoes going to keep falling do you think? I think uh, this process now is irreversible. That's my, that's my view. I think it's, uh, it's created, a, um, uh, in, in my view, a seismic shift in the politics of the Middle East. Uh, it, it moved very quickly from Tunisia to Egypt. It's now in, in Libya. We all thought Yemen was next, perhaps Algeria. It's moved to Libya quite unexpectedly and quite spectacular in my view. I think what's happening right now is not so much about the domino effects, but a lot of Arab masses, even in Bahrain for the matter. Yeah. I mean, Bahrain is doing quite all right, but what the Bahrainis are demanding, and I was listening to a Bahraini on, on Al Jazeera last night, the message and the, and the demands are extremely specific and articulate. You know what they want? They want no longer a ruling family they want a royal family and a parliamentary and a constitutional monarchy, mm -hmm. parliamentary elections. That is a very sophisticated demand. Yeah. Like we don't mind the king to be there, Al Khalifa, but we want him to be a royal, not a ruling. Yeah. So their messages are becoming extremely sophisticated. And the reason why they're articulating them like that is because they know what they can achieve. Mm -hmm. And what they can achieve is real democracy with accountability and transparency. Sally Totman, do you think it's a mistake to assume that this is a bit like the crumbling of the Soviet bloc, that once one goes, they all go? Because, the, as we've heard, there are really unique factors in each one of these countries, and, and one won't necessarily lead to the other one falling. Well, as Fetty said, each country is wanting something different. In Morocco, it's the same thing. They want to keep the king, but have a parliamentary you know, electoral system. Um, and I think the other thing, too, is we can't really lump them all together because they are all different already. Um, they have a very different history and they have a very different system as it is. So or while the sort of the head honcho might be going, um, what will come out of it will be very different. And do you think that these young people that might take the place of some of the leaders stand any chance of, of changing the societies that they live in? Um, a little bit, but I don't think they're going to bring about a cure for all the, the problems that exist in these countries have some really big problems, serious problems that, you know, um, no one can fix almost. They're endemic. Larry Stillman, is that your view? Oh, I think there's probably a whole class of 
women and men between the ages of, say, 25 and 40 who will move in and become the new uh, meritocracy. We can perhaps uh, look to them for leadership and the young ones will need to learn the ropes, I suppose, and raise their families for a few years and then they'll become part of the new, of the new elite, I suppose it will be. So they'll change the world one tweet at a time. Is that what you're saying? Perhaps. <laughs> All right, well, let's just pause the discussion there. I can kind of feel like there's this uh, burning desire to ask questions from our audience. So we have got some ushers out there with microphones. Uh, there's one on this side, I think one on that side as well. So please put your hand up and, uh, and go for it. We'd like to hear from as many of you as we can get to. So uh, I think we've got an usher here that's approaching. If you can just introduce yourself uh, with your name, please, and, and uh, also direct your question to whoever you'd like to answer it. My name is Richard Curtin. I just wanted to ask about the significance of the large US aid program to Egypt and to what extent that has created an aid dependency mm -hmm. and a clientele class in, in the form of the military. Uh, to what extent is, is, is Egypt in fact, a, a military-run state. Are you talking about aid generally or military aid? Well, the, the US oh. aid budget, which yeah. is extremely large. Yeah, I think 1.3 billion a Two year billion to a the year. million. Two billion, yeah. Military Two billion. Okay. Who wants to answer that? <laughs> well, look, I mean, uh, very, very briefly, I think you're right. Uh, I think that's part of the problem, that a lot of these states have lost legitimacy because they've become what we call client, clientele states vis-a-vis -vis the, the West. And the Egyptian system in particular, it has always been, by the way, ruled by, by military. I mean, if you go back to uh, Sadat and, and Mubarak and before the Manasseh, they all came from the military. And now the, the council that's running Egypt is the Supreme Military Council. So in Egypt, you're right, the military is a very powerful institution, akin to what's happening in Turkey, albeit slightly differently. I think in, in, in Tunisia, it's slightly different. The military is apolitical and therefore never really took direct role in politics. But your point is extremely important. That dependency on, 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 on foreign aid, specifically the military collaboration and military investment from America, has created some problems for the uh, Egyptian uh, government. This whole process has done the Egyptian military's image no harm, really, has it? Because they've seemed to have stayed a fairly steady hand. Yeah, it's, it's, how, it's how they handled the critical stage when Mubarak was basically, uh, you know, he could have perhaps stayed a bit longer and then resulted in more casualties falling, or he could have been pushed to leave a little bit early. And I think the military was, gave him that little nudge, not a push, that we really have to move on. None of this, though, is really going to make the US want to fund the military there less, is it? Because that was the one bit of leverage, ultimately, that the US had over the outcome in exactly. Egypt. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Anybody else want to add anything to that before we go to the next question? I would just say that I don't think that the uh, aid will be as generous next year. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Actually, I want to ask about China, because China's been quite active th through Southern Africa, and they're quite happy to deal with whoever, as long as they have their mining and so on, diamonds and oil. So is China starting to move into North Africa, or are they making overtures? Because that might be the substitute. <laughs> oh, the new they're, in, they're in Sudan, but not in like the North African countries we're talking they're about they're. now. But uh, China will deal with whoever they don't have an ideology. Except money. money. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Trade. All right, who's next? Uh, any hands up? I think somebody's got a microphone there. If you could just introduce yourself first, please. Hi, my name is Shelley Ma. Um, there are lots of Muslims living in this country, as in many other Western democracies, who support democracy as we know it in this country. So I thought I understood you to say that if, if you're Muslim you can't separate the mosque and the state and um, can, you, can you... Can I elaborate? Um, I mean Islam isn't just a religion, it is a way of life is what I meant. And so Islam contains within it um, everything that you need to know about politics, about religion, about love, death, sex, you name it, it's in there. Um, and that's why you can't separate out the politics part from the rest of Islam, is what I meant. I don't believe that, I don't believe that you can't have a democracy and be a Muslim by any stretch of the imagination, but I'm saying that the West feels that an Islamic democracy isn't real democracy. Does that make sense? 
Can I? No. Can I add to that? Perhaps I might answer your question. Yeah. I think, I think you, you, you raise a very important issue there, and I think you, you alluded to the answer earlier, which is uh, Muslim countries, and I don't like them Islamic, it's called them Muslim countries, and there's a difference between Islamic and Muslim. Muslim countries, by and large, have adopted Islam differently in the way they self-govern and self-regulate, and the extent to which Islam as a basis of political ideology has been incorporated into that country varies from Indonesia to Turkey to Tunisia to Egypt to Saudi Arabia, etc., etc. And what I think Sally was trying to say is that Islam does provide not just a value system, but also a basis for deriving a system of governance. Now, that's different from saying that a, a country has to be run by an Islam-based political party. It's really very different. The only two countries that have ever done that in recent memory were Afghanistan and the Taliban. As you remember, the Taliban you know, trying to implement the Sharia and all the, and also to some degree in Saudi Arabia where we find there's a huge emphasis or a huge influence, I should say, of the Wahhabi really kind of fundamentalist brand of Islam. Uh, in all the other Islamic countries, which are um, about 50, uh, except Saudi Arabia and, uh, and Afghanistan, all of them use Islam simply as a way of uh, deriving their own general value system. So, question answered. Yeah. Great. <laughs> All right. I think we've got a question over here. Yeah, my name's John. Um, I was just wondering if you have a democracy uh, in a country like Bahrain, for example, where you have a, I think it's a, a Shiite majority uh, and a Sunni ruling class, uh, do they generally vote along religious lines? Maybe this one's for you. Uh, I, th I think um, th there, are, there have been some, I must say, some uh, not very pleasant attempts to put the sectarian twist on what's happening in Bahrain. And I think it didn't really succeed because even though Bahrain is majority Shia, the ruling family is predominantly Sun is Sunni. I think if you look at the slogans that the Bahrainis were actually uh, carrying in, in those things, it says Shia, Sunni, we're all Bahraini. We all want the same thing. Uh, but to answer your point, as a matter of fact, having a democracy or a parliamentary democracy, which is what they're insisting on, would solve that problem that you are raising, which is because the ruling family becomes a royal family, no longer ruling. And whoever people elect is actually representing them. So you may well have a parliament dominated by the Shia, Bahraini, which works with a royal family, which inherently is, by hereditary kind of rationale, is of Sunni background. So that will actually resolve that issue, not compound it in my view. Do you think democracies in that region can work with factionalism purely along uh, sectarian lines, like, for example, what we see in Iraq or, or in Lebanon? Even? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And if you want any, any, any evidence, look at Lebanon. Hmm. Look, at the, look, look at the sectarian system of governance in Lebanon, which was in many ways created by the French when they left Lebanon in the 40s. And look at the mess Lebanon is today. Hmm. Uh, the, the, the Speaker of the House has to be of a certain denomination, the Prime Minister a certain denomination, the President, even the Chief of the... I mean, it's just a mess. So you don't think it can work? I, I don't think it can work. I don't think it even it's a desirable system of governance. It's not desirable because it encourages nepotism and it encourages incompetence that you were there, not because you are competent. Do you think it might be almost inevitable in some scenarios? I'm saying no. My answer is no. It should not be. It's one vote, one person. Yeah. Is and that, that vote should dictate who wins government, I think, in my view. Is that your view? No. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Um, I mean, people do vote along sectarian lines, but then again, most people, when they vote in an election, vote about the things that affect them most, which is you know, education, health, medical, all those things. And depending on which party offers the best options, they will get the votes. I think the problem in Lebanon is that the system was set up to favour the Christians, and so there was a backlash against that, and that's why it hasn't worked. And the same for the system we've set up in Iraq. You know, it's meant to sort of uh, allow the Kurds sort of some autonomy and the Sunnis protection, yeah. and there's been a backlash against that. But I think if the Bahrainis vote as Bahrainis, um, they will vote for the best government to serve them, and I don't think the sectarian issue has to come into it. That's what I was saying. So I it, it, it didn't work. No, 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 no. I said, no, no, I think, I think let, let, let me clarify. What I'm saying is sectarian basis of political systems do not work. 
sectarian basis, meaning that you... Setting up a system that was based on sectarian lines. No, no, what I'm saying is if you vote, if you, if you choose a system like Lebanon's, where you have, you have allocated seats in parliament and a specific numbers because of who you are in terms of your uh, confessional belonging, for me that doesn't work. Uh, if you want real democracy, it has to be one person, one vote. Full stop. But ultimately, given, as we've discussed quite recently, the impact of, of religion on people's lives in many parts of the world, but particularly this region, isn't it almost inevitable that people will choose to vote at least in some way along those lines. Yeah, and that's inevitable, but we should not uh, create that into an institutional system. And that's what happened in Lebanon, and that's what happened in Iraq to some degree. And what I'm saying is once you put quotas allocated on the basis of your confessional denomination, I mean, you are really setting yourself for failure. Whereas you can vote for someone because you identify with in terms of a religious background, that's okay. But you're not allocated a quota. Mm. in Parliament based on you, you belong to the uh, uh, Maronites or you belong to the Shia or the Sunni in Lebanon. I think that's what created a lot of problems in Lebanon and there's really such an unstable uh, system of governance there with, with governments falling almost every, every season. Yeah. We're clearly not going to sort all this out between the four of us. Uh, any more questions? I think there's a gentleman here with his arm in the air. Oh, hi, my name's Mike. Um, this is a bit hypothetical because it's painfully not going to happen, but there was a, an interesting debate online today I was reading out of an article in The Guardian about if Saddam Hussein was still in power and hadn't been um, moved by force. I'm just curious in each of your opinion on whether the momentum that's in place now in the domino falling theory, whether you reckon that might have been enough to have changed things in Iraq without the need for a war? Larry Stillman, I'm sure you've got a view on that. That's a very hard question because he would have had another, what, eight, nine, ten years to uh, build up his military power and terror. So I doubt that such a movement um, might have achieved much. I think he'd still be in power and brutal. I don't know how the others think. And an American ally because I can, I can remember back in 1988 in the States and I saw some cable TV and they're going on and on about he was our strong ally, fair but firm. So, you know, he could swap sides easily and he might be a friend of the United States now. Do you think if he was still there that uh, maybe we wouldn't be seeing all of this uh, volatility in the region? Is that, is that more of a pertinent question? It's possible. I mean, mm. I mean, crystal ball gazing is always, you know, um, a courageous thing to do. But I think I disagree with what you said. I think he... Um, would have had another 10 years of sanctions on him, UN sanctions, and I think the Iraqi condition would have been so poor um, that, you know, I, I don't know how many Iraqis would be left to rise up against him. They'd all be dead from starvation. Um, hard to know. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts from you on that? I'd much rather focus on who's there right now. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, have we got anybody else that would like to ask a question before we... We've probably got time for another one or two, I think. Uh, hi, my name's Mark Higginbotham. I've got a question for Dr Stillman. Um, a lot of the talk about the legitimacy of the demonstration focuses on whether or not it, it uh, is going to achieve a positive outcome. Was the demonstration worth the effort? I think that sort of misses the point, and, um, which is that tyrants deserve to be overthrown. So in Egypt, uh, that was a totally illegitimate person stealing from people, murdering his own people. Does Facebook um, allow an opportunity where <clears throat> the next tyrant will be more nervous? If you look in the States, for example, the power of social media has been incredibly strong. So it does uh, scare MPs of all stripes. And you can see how Sarah Palin works. I mean, she's been using exactly the same tools as the Democrats. So. Um, it all depends upon who's running, you know, who's doing what. It's, it's a platform that can be used by anyone and in the right circumstances anything can happen. And that's the real scary thing about it, I suppose, that um, if you have someone very, very nasty who's a brilliant a manipulator, they could do something terrible. And there was a wonderful film about this made in 1970 called The Rise and Rise of Michael uh, Rimmer about the rise of a dictator in the UK. And it's precisely about this, with someone who's incredibly media savvy can manipulate the situation. Mm. So I haven't specifically answered it, but it is a tool that can be used either way. I mean, Al-Qaeda's used 
social yeah, media exactly. Thank very you. successfully. I mean, yeah, you know, that's right. I guess uh, I, I recall an interview with a senior Taliban guy a couple of years ago who was using his iPhone and, and taught me all about how he was using Twitter. I was absolutely amazed given that mm. they'd uh, kind of forbid anything like that while they were in power.